Well, greetings and blessings again. For a scripture passage, you can open your Bible to Ephesians and chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. So I just want to read four verses here from the book of Ephesians, and that is the, the first uh, four verses of the chapter. Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. The 1611 King James Version says, uh, nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I want to talk this morning around some thoughts of, of children obeying and honor, honoring, just briefly, but prim primarily... I want to, to focus on the, the portion to you fathers. Provoke not your children to wrath, but to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So what does it mean to not provoke? The instruction here is to not provoke. So it seems like, given in such a simplistic form here, there is somewhat of a natural tendency for fathers to provoke their children. The instruction here is to not do that, but rather the instruction is to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So what does it mean to provoke and what does it mean to nurture? So last week I had mentioned that every organization, every institution, and every social grouping requires leadership and also followers, and that this would include family, church, work, educational institutions, any type, of, any type of social organization does require leadership and following. And I think this passage in Ephesians is getting to the heart of what it means for the fathers to be the leaders of their homes. Last week we had looked at the, the, the verses in Matthew 20 verses 24 through 28, and also Mark 10, from 42 to 44. And Jesus tells us in those passages that the princes of the Gentiles exercise lordship. But he tells us that that is not the ethic for his followers. So Gentile lordship is position-based. It is, I have a position Therefore, do or bear the consequences. Jesus further clues us in that leadership that is not Gentile style leadership uh, must include serving. But sometimes servant leadership is misconstrued as I serve you, therefore do or bear the consequences. But in Luke 22, we looked at this last week, Luke 22, verses 25 to 27, Jesus presses further into what servant leadership looks like. It is not service in exchange for the right to rule, but rather it is valuing those that are served above oneself. Jesus asked the question, who is greater, the one serving or the one being served? And Jesus answers his own question saying, it's the one being served. But immediately he follows it up with, I am among you as one that serves. In that, Jesus was creating a value statement in that he valued uh, his, his followers even above himself. And I'm convinced that in no other place of life is this mindset more necessary than being a father? 
I've told people many times that I, I am a business leader. That's what I do. And I am a brother in a church. And as a brother, I have a place of influence like you do among you. But as a father, and that place of influence that I have in my home, it is the most challenging. It is, it is the hardest. It requires the most of me. So I think it touches us in, in personal ways. It touches us very closely. I think it reflects very closely who we are as a person. The failures that we experience in family life strike us to our very core. But the joys that we experience in family life, I think, are, are unmatched. As the book of John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And that is absolutely true. When I see my children make, make choices for, for good that, that sometimes uh, maybe surprise me, like, like, wow, where did that come from? That was, that was amazing. That was a good choice on your part. It's like the joy that that brings is, is unmatched by, by any other earthly joy. You know, some kind of business success, making a big sale or beating some kind of record is like, oh, that's great, that's nice. But it is nothing in the personal sense that observing children making choices, right choices, has. So again, I'm convinced that, that leading a family re requires more of us than any other place of influence that we could possibly hold in life. So I want to dive just a little deeper and look at what, uh, what provoking versus nurturing um, could look like. So first of all, what are some things that, that cause provoking? What are causes of provocation? I have a few written down here, and by no means is this list exhaustive. Hopefully you can think of some more and I'd be glad to have your feedback as to what some of these ways are that can actually cause uh, provoking or provocation. First one I wrote down is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is do as I say, not as I do. Do as I say, not as I, not as I do. Many times parents will demand things of their children that they themselves do not do or unwilling to do, or refuse to do. And that can cause, um, that can provoke. Why do I have to do it if you don't have to do it? Or why do I have to do it if you're not doing it? I'm not talking about little jobs where mother says, Brenton, go feed the chickens. And uh, he says, why do I have to do it? You're not doing it. And she says, Oh, I could easily do that. I have other more important things to do. You go feed the chickens, right? Not talking about those types of things. We're talking about character traits where we, 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 where we demand, we want honesty, obedience, cheerfulness out of our children, and yet we don't exhibit those same traits ourselves. That is a, a way in which we can provoke our children to, to wrath. Another one is authoritarianism. Do what I say without, without questioning. Now, there's certainly a place for that, especially when children are younger. They need to be told what to do, and they need to do it. And uh, they don't always have to ask questions. And as they get older, they don't always have to answer, ask questions. But being open to questions, I think, is important. I, th I think being open to questions is important. Uh, maybe, not, uh, maybe not even always having a great answer. Sometimes there's values that we hold that we're just going to, to share the value and require this because of a value that we hold, something that's valuable to us. But it can cause, uh, it can provo provoke them to anger when we basically say, do what I say and I don't want any questions. That can actually provoke anger. And I think we should be willing to, to hear questions. And, um, and again, sometimes the answers aren't, aren't uh, world and life-changing answers. Sometimes they not, may not be that great. Sometimes they might not even be that true. But um, at the end of the day, we need to be able to have those, have those conversations. 
What about anger? The angry father syndrome sometimes is referred to, where fathers are just angry. Well, that provokes children to anger. When father's angry because maybe he's powerless to change the situation, maybe he's angry and frustrated because he can't uh, see some change in his family he wants or some change in his um, uh, social standing or his financial standing or something like that. And there's like this seething um, anger that's just maybe just under the surface. Your children will pick that up, and they too will mirror that type of, um, of anger. Another one is defensiveness. Defensiveness is where we, a child might say, you know, why, why is this required of me? Or why should I do a certain thing, that type of thing. And we, and we become defensive and basically say, you don't, have the right to, you don't have a right to ask this question. Or maybe we might say, you don't have a right to feel that way. You shouldn't feel that way. Well, children's feelings are feelings, right? If they feel something, they feel something. It doesn't mean they're always justified in what they feel. There may be a misunderstanding. But when a person feels something, they feel something. And we need to learn to, to validate those feelings, or at least to recognize them. Maybe not always validate because they could be wrong. But we need to at least uh, learn to, to hear uh, what our children feel and not become defensive and say things like, like, you don't have a right to feel that way. What about foolishness? Foolishness simply diminishes the person that you need to be. When dad is foolish, he's simply diminishing himself as a person. Now granted, we're probably not always as sober-minded and serious as we should be. But it should not be, we should not be looked at by our children as being a foolish person, but rather someone who's, who's sober and, uh, and serious and, uh, and means, means what he says and says what he means. Another one could be aloofness, simply not being present or not being approachable. Aloofness can take many forms. It can take uh, just preoccupation where uh, someone is deep in thought and child's asking a question. They're saying, Dad, Dad, Dad. Dad's not present. That happens at our house. And uh, sometimes I have to be woken up out of my, you know, my uh, deep thoughts. Maybe they're not even that deep. I'm not sure. Just zoned out. And, uh, or maybe we're just got our nose in a book, a nose in the newspaper. Maybe we're watching something on our phone and we're just not present. Another thing would be to not be approachable. Aloofness can be not approachable. Our children would like to have a conversation with us about something. Just don't know if, uh, if they should come and bring it up to us. I remember, I remember when I turned 16, there was this conversation I wanted to have with my dad, but I just didn't know if, if I should bring it up. And uh, I just got my license, and I wanted to know if, like, is it okay when I feel like I need a you know, I need to park something, something at the pig house. Can I jump in the vehicle? Can I drive, drive up the road to Weaver's Fix-It Shop and get that bolt that we need? Or do I need to come and say, hey, Dad, may I take the pickup truck and go up the road to, to get this, this bolt? I remember one time I was sitting in the kitchen there, and just this conversation was going through my head, going through my head, like, should I ask Dad this question or not? And ultimately, I did not ask. I, I didn't ask the question. And, um, and I think I just chose to, to go up the road and, and get what I needed. And, uh, and sometime later, I went to, to M.M. Weaver, the, the tractor dealership, and picked up a, a, a filter for, for something. I got back, and Dad said, hey, where were you? I said, oh, I went to M.M. Weaver. I got the, the fuel filter. He says, oh, okay, that's great. All right. So and that, he didn't tell me that I needed to come and ask him every time I want to take the vehicle. So I kind of learned by deduction that, that certain things were okay for me to, to go. But I'm just giving that as an example of something where I would have liked to have a conversation with my dad, but for some reason I just didn't quite feel that he was approachable about that. Maybe I didn't trust the answer. I'm not sure. Maybe that's what it was. But the point, again, is to not be aloof, but to be approachable. And then another one would be avoidance. 
particularly a problem avoidance, avoiding things in the family and in the relationship that needs to be addressed. That can, uh, that can produce, that can provoke our children to anger when we're avoiding the problems that we should not be avoiding. All right, let's t look a little deeper now at, at nurture and admonition. So we looked at some things that cause provocation or can be caused for provocation. What are some things that are nurture and admonition related? Again, not an exhaustive list. I have a few things written down. I'm sure there's quite a few more and maybe these are just ones that are important to me and probably you have others that are important to you and again, I would invite your uh, feedback, your uh, further thoughts around these things. So the first one I wrote down is, is consistency. Life and teaching aligned. It's probably not always perfect, but it's going to be at least credible. That they will, they will see an honest attempt within our lives that there will be a consistency between the things that we say and the things that we do. Another one is, is to respect them. Respect them as an individual. Each child is an individual. And to, uh, to honor and respect them as a person, I think, is a way that we can, can, can nurture them and, and help them to grow into who they can be, along with that is acceptance. <laughs> Accepting them for who they are, but always moving them to who they can be. Our children need to be accepted for who they are, but it's our responsibility to move them to who they can be. Sometimes our children have, have character traits or, or quirks that might annoy us. I say sometimes that uh, sometimes you see in our children, they got the best qualities between my wife and I. You blend my wife's best qualities and my best qualities, you see them blended in our children. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's the other way. Sometimes our worst flaw and her worst flaw, you kind of see that amplified too. And uh, we just need to learn to accept them for, for who they are. But move them to who they can be. <clears throat> trust. Learning to trust their good intentions. Learning to trust them as an individual. I'll give you one example of how, how my dad apparently trusted me with his pickup truck. Where I could go up the road and get the part I needed to, uh, to keep the farm going. And he was fine with that. Didn't, uh, didn't demand that I account for every, every use of the, of the pickup truck. And those, that was not just one instance. Uh, my dad was a man who trusted uh, me deeply, I think. Uh, probably more so than what, uh, than what he should have. In fact, I'll give you this story. I was living in a house. After, when I was teaching school, I was living in a house by myself. And um, this is a little house in Westfield. And um, the school had rented it, and there I was living by myself. And some people came up from Pennsylvania, and they, and they cleaned the house. What well, was discovered that within the house, there was a stash of very um, inappropriate magazines. I'll just say it that way. Very inappropriate magazines in the house. And they went to my dad and said, you need to check in on Andrew to see what it is that he's, you know, indulging in these days. And uh, they said, now it is possible that they were just in the house, you know, when he, when, when he moved in there. And so my dad, my dad said to them, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think he's into it. I, don't, I don't, do not believe that they were his. But he did ask me, he said, were those magazines yours? I said, no idea they were there. They were on top of, a, I don't know, something. And I said, I had no idea they were there. Now, thankfully, I didn't, because if I had known, I'm not sure I would have had the strength to actually resist. But um, the point is, um, my dad knew me well enough to trust that I was not, um, not into that, had not been seeking that out and uh, making that a part of my life. And that, <clears throat> that was very, very meaningful to me. When that, when that happened, I remember how meaningful that was to me that he trusted me deeply enough to, to, to believe that I had not been indulging in those inappropriate magazines. So can, can we learn to, to trust our children's good, good intentions? Listening. 
The word listen is spelled with the same letters as the word silent. So to listen, you've got to be silent. And I get it, you know, as, as a father, there's just so much I want to say sometimes, just so much I want to teach, so much wisdom I want to impart, right? So much knowledge I want to transfer, you might say. But sometimes we just have to listen. You actually got to listen to where they are. Because we can be trying to teach and trying to explain something to them that's way out here, and they're way over here somewhere. So the only way to really find out where they, where they are is to, to listen. And listen requires being silent. Compassion. Their little troubles are big to them. Sometimes the little things that get our children down are almost funny. Sometimes, you know, you see them so discouraged over something small, and sometimes it almost makes them want to laugh. Like, like, how can something so small be so discouraging? But to them, it's real. So it's, it's very hurtful to, uh, to mock those little things that, that are real to them. So, so compassion for their feelings is, is very important. It's a way to nurture and, and admonish them. This one goes without saying, but, but love them. Do your children have any doubt that you love them? If someone says to them, do your parents love you? There should be like no hesitation. That absolutely, my parents love me. Another one is, is discipline. Uh, restraining, curbing their selfishness. Proverbs 29, 17, discipline thy son, and he will give you rest. Amazing how discipline brings rest. And uh, the Proverbs method, Proverbs method of discipline is very, very effective. It should be used mostly, I think, when they're young. Frank Reed says that children to receive the Proverbs method of discipline, probably should mostly not remember it. And if they get, if they get the Proverbs method of, of discipline when they are, are young, they won't need it when they're older. I have, a, I have a sister who is ashamed to tell anybody how old she was when she received her last uh, well-placed Proverbs discipline. And... <laughs> And uh, I did get it out of her one time. I won't tell you because she's embarrassed, but it was very young. But she was a sweet, a sweet girl and still is. And I think dad, my dad had mastered that art of bringing well-placed Proverbs discipline early in life, so early that few of us even remember, that we remember very, very little of it. And, and I think he was, he was a master at bringing our little wills into conformity with, uh, with his will. <clears throat> Here's the thing. I've never seen the exception to this. Those who oppose the well-placed Proverbs disciplines and call it physical abuse always resort to verbal abuse. Always. I've never seen an exception. Those who resist the, the Proverbs method resort to verbal abuse. All right, just a few final thoughts on leading your family well. And uh, this kind of harkens back to what I had shared last week. But here's some, some ways in which I think each one of us can practice how to be uh, a good father, a good leader. And, and this, this is number one, is to be a good follower. First, to be a good follower. To be a good father, you must first be a good follower. Just as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. All good leaders, all good fathers are first, or, let me say it this way, all good fathers are simultaneously leading and following. So demonstrate your need and your ability to, to follow. Submit to a group of brothers. Be respectful of government authority. But most of all, Follow the cause of Christ. Just 
may the cause of Christ consume us and fill us and drive us, and we follow hard after him. And as we do that, our children can follow us. <clears throat> Just as Paul said, they can follow us as we follow Christ. Number two, value your children above all other pursuits in life. And that goes back to that, that servant leadership as taught in Luke 22, where Jesus said, who's greater, the one serving, the one being served, or the one served? I'm sorry, the one being served or the one serving? And then he answers his own question where he says, the one uh, being served is greater, and yet he is one that served. Jesus valuing his followers, excuse me, his followers above himself. We too as children, I'm sorry, we too as parents need to value and respect our children even above our own lives. Think of it this way. Are you willing to give your life for a child, for your child? In many ways, I think, uh, I think women are a good demonstration of this. I remember Paul Dieter, an old pastor at uh, the church where I grew up, he would say this. He would say this many times. He, he would say, Darwin's smiling. He probably remembers this. Okay. He would say, um, he would tell his children, he would say, you may disrespect me, but says, you may, not you may not disrespect your mother. She put one foot in the grave when she brought you into this world. Remember that? You put one foot in the grave. What, she put one foot in the grave when she brought you into this world. He would say that over the pulpit many times. Made an impression on me. And uh, <clears throat> there is a sense in which, uh, which that's true. Uh, with the difficulty of bringing children into the world through childbirth, uh, mothers truly are putting their life on the, the line for the opportunity for their children to have, to have life. It's a good demonstration of them valuing their children above their own life. But we too, as fathers, do we, are we willing to value our children's lives above our own lives? Number three, be an example. They are watching. They will imitate. Example is so, so powerful. And one time, Glenn and I were having this conversation about, about New Testament families and leading families in the New Testament era and so forth. And I think, I think it was Glenn that said, there's so frustratingly little about how to, to lead our families. So frustratingly little as far as instruction. And as we discussed it some more, we kind of came to the conclusion, conclusion that there was a huge ethic and a huge emphasis surrounding example. There's not that much about do this and it equals this, but there's a lot of teaching surrounding example. Being the very person, you being the very person that you want them to be. Fourth, to grow. I'm just gonna put it to you and to myself, but you have not attained. You have not attained yet. We all have room to grow. And we need to continue to grow throughout life. And as our children grow, they will need us to grow as well, to basically stay ahead of them, if you will. It's not really for the purpose of staying ahead, but we have to grow throughout life in order for our children to, to grow. If, if they surpass you in their personal growth, they will exit your influence in many ways. But if you grow throughout life, if you continue to grow throughout life, I believe that we can have a lifetime of influence on their lives. So let's think of it this way. If, um, if on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the best, most effective uh, father that you can possibly imagine, and one being the worst, the most inexperienced and ineffective person that you could imagine, if, if you're somewhere, you grow in your life, uh, and this is an arbitrary scale, right? Let's say that you grow to a, a three or a four, and your, your, your children come along, and they experience life, and they grow, and you don't grow. They may grow up to, uh, they may surpass you. They may go from a four to a five to a six. But they're going to be looking elsewhere for that leadership. They're going to be looking elsewhere for that influence because, because you have not... Uh, continue to grow. They're going to be reaching out. An example of that 
is is an, in my own experience, and this is probably one of the one of the things I look back and say was a bit of an oversight or perhaps a, a failure on the, the part of my my dad. I respect my dad immensely, probably the for sure the most influential person in my life. But when I was very young, uh, in my early twenties, he put up huge amount of, of money into a business idea that I had. And, and then he went about his life. And he basically went on his way. And, and here I was as a young man with this massive responsibility, massive investment, and, and he was basically doing what the Lord you know, called him to in his life. And maybe I was resisting his, his influence. Maybe I was resisting his discipleship. Um, maybe I was resisting his, his leadership to a point there's, it's possible, but in many ways, <laughs> I think my dad thought I was smarter than I am. I think he, I think he thought I was, uh, my IQ was higher than it is. I'm not sure. It just seemed like he just kind of, in some ways, I've said this before, gave me the keys to the kingdom and said, run with it. And it was not, it was not for all the good. It, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful for what my dad uh, did for me and all of that. But I would, looking back, I would have loved and would love now to have had my dad walk beside me through through many years, through many years of of business learning um, experiences and things like that, to have him beside me much closer in those things would have been an absolute blessing. And I've, I've said to my sons that that you know I don't want to stifle you in life. I want you to be able to experience the things that you want to experience. I want you to you know work the things that you want to work and that kind of thing. But if you'll permit me, I would actually love to walk, walk beside you in some possibly business-related, work-related, investment-related things and give, give you some of my things that I have learned <clears throat> that, that I didn't learn from, from my dad. And, uh, and they said, yeah, we'd, we'd love that. We'd, uh, we'd welcome that. And uh, so, I, and again, that's not to reflect negatively on my dad at all. It may just have been a, an oversight on his part. And maybe he got the vibe that I was resisting. I, I, I don't know. But the point, here's, here's what I'm going back to, and that is this, that in that area of life, I reached outside of his influence. And I got influence from a lot of other people. And it wasn't all for the better. Some of the influence that I reached out and got because I was not getting from him was not to my spiritual benefit. And... And I, that's something that if, in my own experience, hopefully, that, uh, that I can be, be aware of. So if we, if we continue to, to grow and have a desire to influence our children throughout life, I think, uh, I think God will give us that opportunity. They will follow you when they're young because they really have no choice, right? A young child really can't take care of himself, really has no choice but to, to do what you say, to follow you. Uh, when, when they're uh, very young, they will follow you and do follow you. But, they may, but it may only be because they don't have a choice. But as you get older, they, they might continue to follow you because they, they like you. You might have a solid relationship with them, and they like you. They enjoy the relationship. So they continue to receive influence uh, from you. As they get older, they may continue to follow you because of what they see in you. Maybe you've been successful in many areas of life. Maybe you've been successful in creating a good family life. Maybe you've had a good church experience. Maybe you've made a good living. Maybe you have a, a certain social standing. There could be a lot of ways that they could look at you and say, uh, I like the way that dad is, is following Christ, and I will continue to receive that influence um, from him. And as they get older, they may continue to follow you because it changes who they are. It begins to change them. They begin to see that if I follow in dad's way, I become a better person. I begin to be changed from the, from the inside out, and I begin to recreate those experiences for, for my family. As our children come up and they get married, have children, that type of thing, 
they will continue to learn from from dad because of the of the way it is producing results and change and growth in their own lives and so may it be that each one of us this morning would think carefully about the possibility about the possible ways that we could be causing provocation that we could be provoking and let's be careful to to stop that if we're causing provocation provoking let's let's grow let's end that and but more even more so let's think carefully about ways that we can nurture and admonish them in the ways of the lord thank you for listening and uh,